Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here uh, and an honor to celebrate with you, Chancellor Mnookin. We're really thrilled to have uh, your vision here on campus and uh, to participate this week in the celebrations is really uh, quite thrilling. Uh, and there's so much to appreciate. And in your introductory mar remarks, the opportunity to appreciate is really so special. Uh, and it is really a good thing for us to do periodically. Uh, some people ask me why I've stayed at UW-Madison all these years. I could have gone other places. And one of the things I say with uh, a um, uh, really uh, so much truth to it, and pardon those who um, may live on the coast, but one of the things I say is that egos are not quite grown as large in the Midwest as they are on the coasts. Uh, and it makes for barriers that are more permeable. And that has been my experience. And the kind of work we do here at UW-Madison is kind of radically interdisciplinary. And uh, this has been a place which has really not just uh, accepted it, but it's nurtured it. And uh, for that, I really am so deeply grateful. So I want to share a little bit about our work, and it's a tale of two kinds of stories. The first part is the bad news, and the second part is the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is that well-being is really going downhill globally, and there are, uh, 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 there are specific indicators of that in so many different places in the world and in so many different sectors. Let me give you a few data points close to home. Among college students in America, 67% of women college students have a psychiatric, a reportable psychiatric disorder. 67% in 2022. Among men college students, it's a little over 50%. Loneliness is dramatically increasing. 76% of United States adults report themselves to be either moderately or significantly lonely. And one thing that you may not appreciate is that loneliness is greater than twofold the risk factor for mortality than is obesity. So these factors are not just subjective experiences in the mind, but they actually get under the skin and they affect our physical and our mental health. Another data point, the American College of Sports Medicine recently in 2022 uh, evaluated the health and well-being of 100 cities in America. Madison came out really great in terms of physical fitness, but you know where we stood in mental health among 100 cities in America? We were 95, five cities from the bottom in this survey from the American College of Sports Medicine. So we have a lot of work to do. Just two other data points. In 2021, there were 22 military suicides per day among the United States military. That includes veterans and active military. 22 per day. We've lost more personnel to suicide in the military than we've lost in every war combined since World War II. Among physicians, doctors, there's more than one physician suicide every day in the United States. So we are suffering a grave problem of well-being or the lack of well-being. And let me just say one other thing. Climate change is having a serious toll on our mental health. In a recent survey of American college students, two-thirds of American college students reported that the anxiety that they're feeling about climate change, which has now been called eco-anxiety, is debilitating and interfering with their everyday life. Two-thirds. So that's the bad news. 
let me share the good news. The same mechanisms in the body and the brain that encode suffering, and these are mechanisms of neuroplasticity and epigenetics. Epigenetics is the science of how our genes are actually expressed. That those mechanisms that are impacted by adversity are also mechanisms that we can harness for the good. And it turns out that we can actually cultivate skills of well-being. And we have done extensive research and many other scientists now showing that well-being is actually a learnable skill. And if we practice at it, we will get better. In 1963, when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech in Washington, the title of his speech was not, I have a nightmare. <laughs> Having a dream of what is possible is part of the ingredients for actually cultivating well-being. Let me give you a few examples of recent work that we've done. Just before COVID, we did a well-being program with pre-service teachers here at the University of Wisconsin School of Education. These were uh, folks who were in their last semester of education school just before they were launched in their career to become full-time teachers. This was just before COVID. And one of the things that we did during COVID is we followed these teachers up and we asked the simple question, how many of these teachers are still teaching? And this was in the context of a randomized controlled trial, the kind of highest rigorous standards of clinical research. So we had a group getting the well-being training and another group who received a professional development seminar in its place. And then we followed these individuals who had been randomly assigned during COVID, and we asked, how many of these teachers are still teaching? Now, we are suffering from a crisis of teachers leaving the profession more quickly than they're entering it in America. There is a, a, a devastating shortage of teachers. And what we found is that the teachers who were randomly assigned to our well-being training were six times more likely to still be teaching today, six times more likely. And we calculated the benefit cost of this program. For every $1 invested in this well-being training, there was a $3.34 return on the investment based on the retention data alone within three years. So these data are really powerful in suggesting the importance of this kind of training of these skills. In another study during COVID with about 700 school teachers in the Madison Metropolitan School District and in other public school districts in Wisconsin, we did a similar well-being training. We found dramatic reductions in measures of depression and anxiety and improvements in their well-being, but we also find trickle-down effects in the students themselves. And so this is tremendous leverage that we can achieve by helping the teachers show up in the classroom in a way when they're fully present and connected. So let me just end by sharing one or two other very quick thoughts. When human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. I'll bet you everyone in this audience brushes their teeth at least a couple of times a day. The research shows that if we spent even as short a time as we spend brushing our teeth, nourishing our mind every day, this world would be a different place. Thank you.